So we're going to be in Mark chapter 15. Mark 15. And so, you know, the first uh, Sunday of the month, and um, we're going to be having communion. The Passion Series. We've been, we've been um, doing the Passion Series for three years. And uh, today marks that conclusion. And so we've worked through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, not necessarily in that order, but, uh, but anyway, so we focused in on the last days of the Lord's earthly ministry and uh, perfect for Communion Sunday. So now that we've concluded after three years, we'll start over because that's what communion is all about. You know, do these things uh, in remembrance of me and uh, many of the worship songs this morning reflected that. And so I look forward to doing that. But we're in uh, Mark 15. And so I'm just going to read a couple verses to get us started if you'll stand with me. Our text will be verse 37 to 43. But I'm going to read just a few verses. In verse 37, And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that, he cried out like this and breathed his last. He said, Truly, This man was the Son of God. Lord, uh, we thank you for your great sacrifice to us. And I pray that each of us would receive from you this morning those things that you have for us, hand-tailored for us, that you would speak into our lives, uh, Lord, that we'd receive that and be refreshed and be renewed and be re-energized, whatever the situation, Lord, as we look to you and as we remember those things that you've done for us and the promises that you have for us. So bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you can be seated. The title of the message, Jesus Paved the Way. Jesus Paved the Way. Now Jesus said... Recorded in John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. That's a reference really to what benefits us now. You know, from day to day, as like a a shepherd would be taking care of his sheep. And so, I am the door. It's not Jesus' end. It's no back, there's no back door, there's no side door. Jesus said, I am the door. And again, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I I am the life. And it's not Jesus and anything else. So Jesus, we see here, removed that wall of separation, that barrier that kept us from. You know, we might say uh, an open door policy with the Lord. Paul writes, clarifying this same message for in Ephesians 2, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near, For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father, by the work of Jesus Christ, breaking down those barriers. And you notice again there in verse 37, 
where it says Jesus cried out with a, a loud voice and breathed his, his last. And so you have there the very last breath of the Lord recorded. And each of the gospel writers give a little bit more detail um, to that. Matthew records chapter 27, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And then Luke records chapter 23, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. And then John records chapter 19. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. That word there in, used in John 19 for bowing is, is that it's a, it's a word of, speaking of transition. And... At that point, the meaning there, Jesus gives permission for the transition of his spirit. And, you know, we know, we know through, through uh, John chapter 10, where it's recorded, Jesus speaking, Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it, from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And so there also, when we looked at John 19, where it says that bowing his head, he gave up his spirit, and meaning that he permitted his spirit to be given up. And so, basically, Jesus saying, it's a wrap. Mission accomplished. And then he willingly gave up his, his spirit. He released it. And so, it was directed by him. And only then uh, did he choose to breathe his last. And when I read that, I thought, the good thing to consider here is, it's really the same way for us to be confident that not until Jesus chooses that you would breathe your last. To have that confidence, to be confident in that. I like the wording, I like the wording, um, I'm bulletproof until Jesus is done with me. And then to be reminded that he took a bullet for me, in a sense. And um, just to be reminded of that. But not to be insecure when we're headed towards the finish line. Rather, really, really, we should always be confident. And like exemplified by Paul and Peter, where, you know, Paul would write, heading towards the finish line for 2 Peter 4, or 2 Timothy 4, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Then Peter, on the same subject, writes, 2 Peter 1, Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. So in, in looking at the end, he is he's still looking to minister to others concerning the truth of, of Jesus Christ. And so, and so in the same sense, we need that confidence as we would be heading you know, toward that finish line. And so... Also, I want to draw your attention to the next verse there in verse 38, where it reads, So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this 
and breathe his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Verse 38, I'm sorry. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That was the verse I wanted to read. And so here we have in Mark's gospel recorded that this veil was torn. Now this veil that hung in the temple, that was the temple in Jerusalem, was huge. 60 feet tall, and some say as thick as 18 inches, made of a woven material, uh, that tapestry, that curtain. And I mean, you know, I'm not sure, but I think this is 30 feet up here. So you can imagine, just double it. <laughs> and, um, and so it was a very strong material. And, you know, I doubt that a team of wild horses could rip it. You know, my guess is you put two dozers, you know, that couldn't rip it. That's how strong, you know, they make towing straps now out of material about that wide and about that thick and you can tow anything with it without tearing it. Can you imagine a fabric or like that, a curtain hanging like that, what it took to even put it there. But you notice, not by accident, it was, it was torn from, from the top down. And so that, you know, being no coincidence, can you imagine in the temple First of all, getting up 60 feet, but then to be able to tear that from the top down, you know. And so, um, and so the veil there separated humanity from the most holy place. And when the children of Israel were, were moving through the desert in, in the wilderness, they had the, the tabernacle. The tabernacle, the tent of meeting there was a lot smaller version than the temple that was mobile. It, it more pointed to like us being mobile. But, um, but there in the tabernacle in the wilderness, when they were moving from place to place and they would break it down and move it and set it up and move it, they had the veils, smaller version of everything. But behind the veil was the Ark of the Covenant. But in the temple in Jerusalem, they didn't have the Ark of the Covenant. They had uh, behind the veil a, a stone of some sort where they would go in and, um, you know, the high priest would go in and, and put a burning incense on it. And, and, uh, but they didn't have the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God in the camp of, of Israel. What happened to it? I don't know. Uh, I think Indiana Jones knows where it was. And, uh, probably Indiana Jones and God, he knows. But, um, but uh, no, and it tells us though in Revelations 11 that the, Ark, you know, the covenant it's in heaven. Uh, Hank brought that to my attention. <laughs> he asked me one day, where's the Ark of the Covenant? I go, I don't, I'm not sure, you know. He, and then so we went on the Blue Letter Bible and found out, hey, Revelation eleven nineteen says when 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 the temple was opened in heaven the ark of the covenant was there, and so um, so any anyway, not to disappoint uh, Indiana Jones but that's where it's at. But anyway, so uh, and so it's interesting because just the significance of that barrier of separation being torn down by the death of Jesus Christ torn down. Now you can enter by the blood of Jesus Christ into the Holy of Holies. And that's what's represented there, where God himself dwells. And then, you know, what does the Bible say? It speaks of us being the temple. Now we're the temple. Believers, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, corporately as a church, but individually. Two passages, 1 Corinthians 6 tells us, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For we were bought with, at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Then in 1 Corinthians 3, it tells us, do you not know that 
You are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And so we're even a smaller version, but now we have within us the spirit of God because of the work of Jesus Christ because he tore apart that barrier so that we might enter in and that the Holy Spirit might indwell us. And so that veil, again, representing that great divide. Now the Jews are still going to want in the rebuilding of the temple that veil there because they rejected Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and what we see here, you know, and what's written also in Hebrews 9 where it says, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. This is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and, and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. He entered in. He removed the barrier, and we can follow him and be saved. It also tells us in Hebrews um, 10, therefore, brethren, Brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It can't get any more clear than that. That Jesus did that for us, clarifying that. And this miracle, really, of God was like the parting of the Red Sea. It took the power of God to accomplish that. And so this is God going on record that the way of salvation is now open. Open. And so now, as the word tells us, we can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And so under the the old covenant, again, behind the veil was that place that God dwelled. It was out of bounds. As a matter of fact, if you came in contact in any way with the ark in the wrong way, it resulted in immediate death. And so, God's prescribed way of salvation through Jesus Christ. And so, presently under the new covenant, because of what Jesus did, uh, he rendered that whole thing obsolete, the old covenant, in that that reference there. You know, and it it does say in in Romans, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, where it says, there, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I have a teleprompter back there. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I forget to write it down, <laughs> If all else fails, you know, it's quicker. Um, I I told Jeff, I go, I never used that. I just used it. (laughs) But, But why is that so important that we would understand that? Well, because we're prone to be religious. We're prone to seeing what hoops we have to jump through so that I might please God. You know, to be religious, to uh, what, I, what I have to do to get on God's good side. You know, you might say the ark side. You know, what do I need to do? When in fact, God does not have a bad side. I want to get on God's good side. Well, he doesn't have a bad side. And so, God is good When? all the time that God is good and yet the religious mindset paints God to think that he has a bad side and what I have to do to earn it 
Jesus, on the other hand, shows us different. You know, when he shows us that we can be right with the Lord because he finished it. He finished it for you and me with, uh, by the way, your name in mind and my name in mind. And then we look at verse 39. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. He should have said, this man is the son of God, but he's, it's recorded just as he said it. And the centurion, ruler over hundreds, this man's official title while he's carrying out this particular you know, order is exactor mortis. His title, his position at that point. And so he would have been there, appointed at the judgment before Pilate. He would have been there during the scourging that went on. He would have been there when Jesus was stripped and brutalized by the men under his command. And he would have been the one that put the cross beam, or his guys, by his direction, put the cross beam on the, sh- the shoulders of the Lord. And then he would have been the one prodding him along the way, all the way until he collapsed. And then he would have been the one that, you know, would have commanded Simon the Syrian um, to take the cross all the way to the place, Golgotha. And then he would have been there directing the hammering of the nails and the erecting of the cross, the satyrian. And when he witnessed that all along the way and then the final breath and then the, the blessings of Jesus from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. It's interesting because he makes that confession because this understanding would come from the Holy Spirit. And, and there's not a big mention here for the big event that is being signified here. And this is a reminder that God, again, works on multiple levels. He's working on multiple levels. He cares for that centurion and so many others that he's ministering to uh, during this. And, and we know, as recorded in the Bible... God's heart in 2 Peter 3 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so we see the heart of God, and we see his care for this man who had just put Jesus through the grinder and brutalized and tortured the Lord. And so uh, we need to be reminded though that God is also a God of his word. And so he will fulfill all his promise, promise to deliver the righteous, but also and against the unrighteous as he has warned and promised. And so and so we see there in verse 40 there were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, and of Joses and Sol- Sol- Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women, women who came up uh, with him to Jerusalem. And so... I do have to make mention, you know, I hope you don't mind that I pronounce Josis, Josis, because, um, you know, and I come across things that I learn in my study that I don't really need to know, uh, because his name is really pronounced Isoses, Isoses, and I'm thinking like, I'm not going to say that because everybody would think the whole rest of the service about 
Esau says, <laughs> and nothing else. So I call him Josie's. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, you know, I don't know, kind of like once you go down that line, you know, it's like, where do you stop? Do you look up everybody's name and see how they're pronounced in the Greek? Or you just move on with life, you know? And, and you know, um, but, but I came across that, but I go, no, I can't do that. Sorry. But I was watching YouTube the other day, and, uh, and there was this lady who had a heart for elephants, I guess, so that she moved to Africa. And the last 20-some years, she's been sitting in a blind over families of elephants, documenting their every move and their every sound. She's trying to figure out the language of the elephants. And I go, and then when you're done, so? It's like, I thought, I don't want to know the language of the elephants. But can you imagine spending your life trying to figure out the language of the elephants, the, the movements of the elephants, and thinking like, you know, to me that is horrible. But I say all that because sometimes we can get sidetracked learning things that really don't matter. You know, the, the mating call of the wild crane or something, you know. What, what, one, what one means to another, is, you know, I don't really even care. Don't even tell me. If you know, if 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 you if you said if if there was a way of downloading, you can, I can download the language of an elephant in your head. I'd say I don't want it. I don't want to know. You know, but I don't know. That's I got a little off on that. <laughs> anyway, that's 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 pretty bad. But anyway, but look at I want to draw draw attention to verse forty one. Um, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So there was Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the mother of James the less, and uh, then there was many other women. And so again, I want to spin off from last week when the Apostle Paul, remember, he made reference in Philippians where he says, and I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel. Uh, you know, there's an interesting thought here, and that is um, by the Bible going on record to let us know that these women were here, but they're also showing us uh, who wasn't there the men, the men who followed Jesus were nowhere to be found. And so, but in that day, in that day, not only were women not taken serious, but they were considered posing no threat. And as I understand, they didn't crucify women. But on the other hand, you know, <laughs> Um, so these women basically wouldn't be fearing for their lives, but on the other hand, all of the men who could be proven followers of Jesus, who, who were, could be proven connected with Jesus in any way, um, would also be facing crucifixion, the possibility of being crucified. And so a real threat against them, and they couldn't flee fast enough. And I'm not saying that to excuse the actions of the men, or I'm also not saying that to take away the merit of the women, only to help us understand the conditions of the time. Now, by the way, this would exclude the Apostle John, because he was there. And so, but all that changed after the resurrection. And, and that um, all changed in Jesus. The man or woman filled with the Holy Spirit is one to be an equal threat against the enemy of darkness. An equal threat. Man or woman, because of the Holy Spirit in us, because of what Jesus did, man or woman is an equal threat against the enemy because of the Holy Spirit. If we were to boast, we boast in the Lord. And greater is he that is in us, man or woman, than he that is in the world. And so that all changed at the resurrection. 
We certainly saw it, you know, especially with the men. The women were there, but then with the women as well, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so now, in verse 42, when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went in to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. You notice they come in and taking courage. It's like, hmm, what's going to be his response? This is like walking on eggshells here. And, um, and he was a prominent council member. Now, God has his people in place, the prominent in place for strategic purposes to accomplish his will. And Joseph of Arimathea was one of them. And so then, verse 44, a pilot marveled that he was already dead. And, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time so when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body of Joseph. Then he bought, fine, uh, he, he bought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph. Um, or Joseph observed where he was laid. And so no, make note first, Pilate marveled. Uh, Mark, he records the fact that Pilate marveled over all that Jesus went through. He had seen this who knows how many times before, but with Jesus, he marveled more than once. You know, even backing up in the same chapter, verses four and five, um, then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you? But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Yeah, you can't shake up this guy. This guy's different. And so again, and so soon dead. He marveled. Wait a minute. You know, What's going on here? This is unusual. Well, Jesus says, okay, it's finished. And he gave up his spirit. He breathed his last. That's why. And so, and then that last verse, you had um, the two Marys there following all the way to the end there when Jesus' body was put in the tomb. And it says there, they observed where he was laid. And that would be key intel. That would be a keynote observation uh, come Sunday morning. And sure enough, Jesus knew they would be sure to be there, and they were. And he knew who to call upon for that. And God has his people, men and women, in key places for key observations to accomplish his will. And so each of us are called, if you will, to strategic places. You know, you have to believe that. Where are you working for the time? You know, um, that's a key place. You have, to, you have to understand that you are called by God for a particular purpose. The devil wants to, to make you think less of that high calling. We all have a high calling. Now, now, when men see our high calling, they may think, you know, you're more on the bottom of the social level or something by their standards. But you have to understand by scripture, you have a high calling wherever it is that you're at. Maybe for just a short season, but God has you there for a reason. And so it's, it's, for, the, it's for the accomplishing of his will. And so each of us strategically placed. And, uh, and then the question would be, Jesus knew, you know, they would show up, but are you showing up? Are you showing up? Are you following through? Are you, are you keeping yourself in that place 
so that God would be able to use your life? And that's the question we need to ask because we're accountable to God in the station that he has us. It may seem like a menial task. No, it's a high calling. Because if, if, you, if you're representing Jesus Christ and one person ends up in heaven, that is a high calling. That is beyond all the treasures in planet earth. And we have to understand that. The devil doesn't want you to know that. And so, the ushers will be uh, coming up and serving the, the bread and the cup in a few minutes. And um, hold on to that until, uh, until everybody is served. And then I'm going to come up and, and uh, pray. And then we can partake together. Now, things to keep in mind during this time. And uh, Nicole said the song that they're going to be doing during the, this communion time is a, a little bit more lengthy than, than most. So it's going to give us a little bit more time um, to ponder the, what the Lord has done for you in light of the fact that you're a sinner. You know, think of the centurion that Jesus forgave. You know, think about that. Um, we don't need to remember the fine details of our sin, but we, we've been delivered. We've been delivered. We've been set free. And, um, and Jesus wants us to remember his death. Now, we typically will not want to remember somebody's sufferings when we think back on people that have passed. You know, we want to think of the happy memories. You, know, you come to memorial service and so forth, and you, you, know, you talk about the wonderful memories, right, and the things that, that are, are you want people to remember. When I shared at my dad's memorial, I didn't get up there and, and, and talk about all the brutal visits to the hospital at the end and you know they had him in a um, what do you call re induced coma and um, and so forth but in the midst of all of that God did a miracle even then you know because we were there for some days with him and then we were there till really late and and we were going to go home and get some rest and my dad was um, on a um, you know, breathing machine and in that induced coma. And I get, I get home, crawl into bed, tired. And all of a sudden the Lord says, you need to go back to the hospital. It was clear. I got up, went back to the hospital, went in thinking, I don't know what to expect. Ask, ask the nurse, hey, is my, how's my dad? And oh, everything checks out. Well, everything was in line. I went in, looked at him, and thought, okay, well, grabbed the magazine. As soon as I sat down in the seat and opened the magazine, all the bells and whistles went off on his machine. And he was passing right there, and I was there to go hold his hand and talk to him. And, you know, the Lord did a miracle right there. And, uh, and I was blessed, and my mom said he, she, that meant everything to her that he didn't die alone. You know, so so during this time, you can trust that you can you can hear that still small voice of the Lord during this time. What He has to say to you, okay? Um, it's special, the special time of communion. And hey, if you got things that you're dealing with, give them right now to the Lord. Receive the forgiveness. You know, new beginnings, fresh starts, white as snow, no gray zone. Okay, be confident. Just. Turn it over right now. You know, if you need healing for your physical body, just ask the Lord for it right now, for strength to continue on. So Lord, uh, we thank you so much for your love for us and uh, this, this Sunday morning that you blessed us with this first day of the week. We can start this new week, Lord, looking, uh, <clears throat> looking to you and just remembering all that you did for us, Lord, and that you finished it uh, for us, with us in mind. I pray for a blessing upon your people today, Lord, as now we would reflect on our personal relationship with you and where we stand and what you've done and, and what, what you have for us, Lord, just that this would be a special time 
that we would look to you in a special time to partake of this communion. In Jesus' name, amen.